Hello and welcome to our discussion of the right ascension and declination system used in astronomy. So what's the point of having a coordinate system? Well, when we're talking to our friends, we want to be able to tell them where the objects we're seeing are. If we're looking up at the moon or at some cool star, we want to be able to call a friend up or turn to the person next to us or somewhere nearby and say, this is where this object is. Um, and that's why we have coordinate systems. So in this picture, I'm looking up at, say, the moon, and I want to be able to tell somebody on the phone you know, back at port where that moon is or whatever I'm seeing. So that's why we have coordinate systems, so we can communicate the location of objects in the sky. Now, you may already be familiar with the altitude azimuth, or what we often refer to as the local system, for distinguishing the location of objects in the sky. Uh, these little brown lines that are listed here in Stellarium are an altitude azimuth system that work really well for a local group. If I'm trying to talk to someone, you know, in a few houses away, or a few yards away, um, this will work really well. So for example, again, to just kind of reiterate this system, altitude is a measure of how high an object is from the horizon towards the top of the sky. The altitude of the horizon itself is zero degrees, no altitude at all. The altitude of zenith is 90 degrees, and everything else is somewhere in between. The second coordinate is azimuth, and azimuth in the local system is a measure of where you are around the circle. So for azimuth, we had to pick an arbitrary zero line. Again, these lines that are vertical and come together up at zenith there are your azimuth lines. The zero azimuth line is the one we selected that goes from the north point or due north right up to zenith. So anything found on here has an azimuth of zero. As we move east, we see an azimuth of 90, 90 degrees around the circle. To the south, we get 180, not pictured here. And then as you come around to the west, we see an azimuth of 270. All the way back around to zero in the north, or also 360. So azimuth, azimuth tells you where you are around the circle. So for example, our good friend Arcturus here has an altitude of 21 degrees and an azimuth of 278 degrees. From our location here in Sparks, Nevada, um, at 8 o'clock p.m. on the 27th of September. Problem with this system is if I'm trying to tell someone where Arcturus is, location and time change its location. If I look at Arcturus, say, an hour later, it's going to be down here. So its altitude is only 9 degrees, and it's azimuth 287. If I were looking at Arcturus from a different location, say, Seattle, Washington, at 8 o'clock p.m., it's going to have a different altitude than it would in Reno, and a different azimuth as well. If I go all the way up to Barrow, or the north slope of Alaska, at that same time, Arcturus is going to have an azimuth um, of 250 and an altitude way up of 27. So it's hard if I want to say, hey guys, there's a really cool object for you to check out worldwide. It's this amazing supernova event that happens somewhere in the sky. And if I tell them an altitude and azimuth, people in Paris and people in Madagascar and people in Reno are all going to have different altitudes and azimuth. So we need a system that's fixed to the stars a system that doesn't change based on your location. Hence, we have a different system for these purposes. And this is our right ascension declination. So this system is a coordinate system that isn't affected by time of day, season, location, or any of those things. It's a system that's fixed to the stars themselves. For this, we can imagine a sphere of stars that we see from around the Earth. One way to think of the celestial sphere is sort of like if you're a tiny golf ball inside a basketball. The golf ball is like our little earth, and the stars appear on the inside of that basketball, and we can see them all. They appear to be the same distance away for our purposes here when we talk about a coordinate system. Our earth, of course, has a coordinate system that has lines of latitude and longitude attached to it, so we can talk about the location of anything on earth um, using the latitude-longitude system. Well, all we have to do is take this same system and extend it out to our celestial sphere, and we can generally work with that, at least as a template. There are a couple of changes we need to make, but that's where we really start. So again, the basketball is the celestial sphere that it has all of the stars depicted on. We actually have a celestial sphere here in class. Um, this is a celestial sphere around the Earth, and so you can see the Earth kind of like a little golf ball, looks like more baseball size than this one, inside a giant celestial sphere. And you can see that clear sphere around the outside has stars painted on it. And from our perspective on Earth, we can look off 
at any given star on the sphere and talk about its location on the sphere. We just need to have a coordinate system to do that. So, how do we make this work? Well, recall that the North Pole and the South Pole on the Earth are 90 degrees north and 90 degrees south, respectively, when we talk about their latitude. The latitude equivalent on the celestial sphere is called declination. These are lines, again, that measure how far away you are from the poles, or how close you are to the equator, which is that halfway line in between the poles. Similar to latitude, the declination of the north celestial pole also has a value of 90. However, we don't use the letter N to represent it as well. We just say 90 degrees. This way we're talking in pure numbers and not numbers and letters. So now we have to distinguish it from 90 south. Well, 90 south, instead of using 90s, we use the value of negative 90. So anything south of the celestial equator, which we'll get to in a second, it has a declination of negative values. Anything north of the celestial equator, a declination of positive degrees. And again, recall that the Earth's equator has a latitude of zero degrees. Similarly, the celestial equator has a declination of zero degrees. So no change there, similar idea, um, and that's declination. Once again, declination tells us how far away we are from the celestial equator. Zero degrees at the equator itself, 90 north, negative 90 south. But sometimes we need to be very specific about where an object is. Not just 20 degrees north, but say 20 and a half degrees. Now you might be tempted to use a decimal system or fractions, but that's not what we do in the, this system. We take degrees and break them down into minutes. And so there's 60 minutes per degree. So something that would be 20 and a half degrees north would in fact be 20 degrees and 30 minutes north. Um, we can even break those minutes down into smaller things called seconds, and you can take 60 seconds per minute. So something could be 20 degrees north, 30 minutes north, and then 10 seconds on top of that. We represent minutes by little hashes, and seconds by double hashes or quotation marks. Um, and this is how we can really pinpoint in the location of an object. Okay, so now we have declination. So again, here's Polaris, the North Star. Um, its value is very, since it's almost straight above the North Pole, its declination is very, very close to 90, 89 degrees and 20 minutes. However, it's not exactly 90. The, ce the celestial pole is super, super close to it, represented by this yellow dot, and it has that declination of exactly 90. Polaris, for all intents and purposes, is so close, we use it to approximate. But the actual pole is just a little bit off. And then from there, we have these concentric circles of declination that come out. And so 90 being the celestial pole, and we work our way out and out and out and out. So here, this is what we would actually see in the sky. You'd see, looking at Polaris, well, we don't see these circles, but this is how you would talk about the declination system in the sky. The red line around the outside, that's the declination of the celestial equator. And so that's zero degrees. And as you move out 90 degrees from the North Pole, that's what you're going to see. So now we can get closer to describing where Arcturus or any other object is. So for our good friend Arcturus, we have a declination of approximately 19 degrees. So that tells us how far away from the pole Arcturus is, or how far away from the celestial equator it is. Problem is, it doesn't tell us where on this circle we would find Arcturus. Arcturus could be here, but it could also be here. That has a declination of 90 as well. Or over here. Or over here. So in order to talk about Arcturus, we need to not only talk about its declination, but say where on the circle it is as well. And for that, we have another system where we take lines that go right through the pole and go out in every direction. And they look like this, and we call them right ascension. So right ascension is where on the circle Arcturus is. Now right ascension is a little bit more complicated. So for right ascension, instead of using degrees around a circle, we chose to use something more like a clock. So we think of right ascension with Polaris in the center. Um, it looks a little bit like a clock where we have the hands going around in different values. So for right ascension, we measure it in hours, not degrees, much like on a clock. The difference is we use a 24-hour clock instead of a 12-hour clock. So as you go all the way around, you complete 24 hours of, of circle, if you will. So say any object like Arcturus has a declination of degrees, and it's going to have a right ascension represented in hours. 
The hours, like degrees, are, can also be broken down into minutes and seconds, and that should be very natural to us because we already do that when we talk about time, but this time we're talking about location. Minutes, again, represented by a single hash, while seconds represented by two hashes. So just like with longitude, we have to pick an arbitrary zero line to start with. There's no obvious spot like the, the pole or the equator. We have to pick one of these lines. And the line that we pick, and the line that we pick is this one here. Um, why that one there? Um, well, again, it's pretty much arbitrary. We could pick the line going straight from uh, Polaris down to north, but that's different based on where you are. So that's something that, again, would not have us fixed to location. There is a relatively unused thing called hour angle, which actually does that. But for right ascension, we choose this line here, and we give it that value of zero hours. This line, I'll explain to you in a minute, goes through a very important point called the first point of Aries. But from there, we move this direction. This is the only other thing we had to choose. Which way do we go? Well, we're going to go counterclockwise. So there's zero, there's two, then four, and you work your way all the way around 20, 22, and back to 24 or zero. These are lines of right ascension. Again, for right ascension, they're very much like longitude. So these lines meet at the poles and carve out sort of orange slices of the celestial sphere, just like lines of longitude do on the Earth. And again, like longitude, we have to set an arbitrary zero and then work our way around from there. In longitude, our zero angle, or our zero line, is set through the prime meridian in Greenwich, England. In right ascension, we select a line that goes through the first point of Aries. Again, we can't use Greenwich, England because the stars effectively appear to spin around that. So we have to pick a point fixed to the stars. So what is the first point of Aries? Well, the first point of Aries is this spot where the ecliptic passes through the celestial equator in the springtime. In other words, it's the position that the sun has on the spring equinox. So again, uh, you'll see the ecliptic there, you see that celestial equator, that point is the first point of Aries. It's not even in Aries, which is a whole other story altogether. Um, it has to do with precession and the wobble of the earth, but that's the zero right ascension. And from there, we work, on, we work our way around. So with this, we're able to talk about permanent addresses of every star in the sky. So when I call up my friend and say, Arcturus is super bright today, where's Arcturus? And I can tell him, Arcturus has a right ascension of 14 hours, 16 minutes, and 37 seconds, and a declination of 19 degrees, 5 minutes, and 44 seconds. That's where it is. It doesn't matter what day or what time, that's where that's going to be, and that doesn't change. And that gives us our permanent system for talking about where objects are in the sky. Thank you. Hope that was helpful to you.